Hey everybody, welcome back to Cityscape Brewing. My name is Dennis Fields and today we're doing a peach kettle sour. It's still pretty chilly outside and it's the first part of spring is just on the horizon, but I'm already thinking spring and summer. So I've done a ton of different kettle sour videos so you can check them out. Those will be a little bit more in depth than this one will be. Even though I will go through some of the non-typical things that you would need in a brew day, we're gonna do the brew day process pretty quick. Then we're gonna just get into the actual souring process a little bit more in depth and then we'll add the peaches in there. All of my kettle sours are essentially the same. I keep the same base recipe, that'll also be down there as well. And I just change up really what I add as far as any hop additions. Most of the time I don't add any, add any hops or I add just different fruit at the end. And so I'll go through a few of the pieces of equipment that you're gonna need um, that differs from a typical brew day where you're just brewing an ale or a lager. So we'll start that after you hit that like and subscribe button, grab yourself a beer and stay tuned. All right, really quickly, what is a kettle sour? It's essentially an ale that you sour overnight using a bacteria. In this case, we use it from a probiotic yogurt drink called Good Belly Probiotics. You can find this at grocery stores or even buy it on their website at Good Belly. Um, this has uh, lactobacillus uh, planetarium. That is one of the last ingredients here in the bottle. This is what actually sours your beer overnight. And to help that along, we use a little bit of lactic acid. So you'll need a little bit of that. I usually use about 10 milliliters or so. And then you'll need a pH meter similar to this one. I have a couple of recommendations. There's ones for about $15 that will be a little bit cheaper. This one's about 30. I highly recommend getting a good one that has accurate readings. But for this, we're really just trying to see where it started and where it gets to. And so it doesn't have to be the exact pH necessarily, but you should, you should invest in a good one. $30 isn't too much for a pH meter. So I'll show you how I use that one during the process today. Um, and those are the few things that, that you'll need that are different. So we're going to use all of these different items at different stages today. And we're going to show you in depth kind of how and when I use all of these items. Um, but just make sure you have those on hand before you want to start this brew day process. So let's get started. We're going to mill up some grains. We're using white wheat and Pilsner malt. And then we're going to heat up our strike water, uh, mash in, and uh, get that process started. Real quick tip, if you leave this uh, Rubbermaid container out in your garage, make sure you rinse it out real good, of course, and make sure that it's all cleaned out before you start it. But if it's cold in the winter time, it doesn't hurt to add a little bit of warm water. I've just put this uh, not even up to boiling, but just enough to get real, real hot. And this is gonna help take the chill out of the plastic uh, in your mash tun. You can even do this with a, a metal kettle if you want to. And so just go ahead and Pour in just enough, you can see a little bit of steam coming out of there, just enough to warm up the outer shell. That's going to help um, take away any potential of heat loss when you're taking your strike water and putting it in, mixing it in, mashing in, and it will help your uh, mash temperature not be so low. And so in this case, um, I don't want this to be, you know, at 147 when I'm shooting at 150 for this uh, temperature. Uh, for the mash temperature. And so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, warm this thing up. It'll help prevent that being too low as we're mashing in. And then you'll dump that out just before we do the mash in process because you're not wanting to add that extra volume in your mash. All right, our strike water is all heated up. Our water additions are in there. I've dumped the water that we had heating our, our cooler here out so that it's empty. We're gonna go ahead in and mash our greens. Make sure you don't get any dough balls. It is a good idea also, if you want to, to add some rice hulls so you don't get a stuck sparge depending on how susceptible your system is to stuck sparges. Um, I get them every once in a while, not very often, but I do use rice hulls when using like a lot of white wheat like we are today, or even, um, you know, oats or flake barley, stuff that's really sticky. We're gonna take a quick temperature reading after I get this good mixed up, see where we're at. We're sh shooting for 150 mash temperature. We'll let it sit for 60 minutes. The mash process, and sparge process 
is exactly the same as any other ale or lager recipe. We're at 149.8, so we're right about where we want to be. Throw this on quick so we don't lose any temperature. All right, now our mash is doing this thing for 60 minutes. I generally will go a little bit less than that, especially with a very light grain bill like this, light meaning color grain bill. Um, generally, your uh, starch conversion is done within about 15 to 20 minutes. So I generally do uh, 30 to 45 minute mashes sometimes, depending on my grain bill. So you can cut this short a little bit as long as your starch conversion is done. I do have a video uh, showing the starch conversion. You can kind of test that with iodine tincture to see if your starch conversion is complete yet. And so I'll link that in the video description below, but no need to necessarily do 60 minute uh, mashes in all of your, um, your uh, recipes. So in this one, I'll probably cut it to about 45 minutes. I do a 15 minute batch sparge. Since this is kind of a shorter brew day video, I'm not gonna go through step by step on how to do the recirculation and the Vorloff process. Those are for other videos. I'll quickly just uh, briefly go through it. And then we're gonna get right into the boil process and how we actually do the kettle souring itself. So we'll be back after that. All right, we just got done doing our recirculation and vorloffing process. We are now going to start our boil. Uh, so I'm gonna start the burner and get that heated up. We're gonna boil this for about 15 minutes. It's gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna kill off all the bacteria that might be on here already. So to kind of basically sanitize the beer and kill any nasties in there. And it's going to uh, reduce the volume a little bit so we can put this in a glass uh, fermenter that I use in order to sour overnight. You can leave it in the kettle. There's a way to do that. Watch my other kettle uh, sour videos and I'll explain that in more detail. As the kettle approaches uh, boiling point, it's getting about 200 degrees or so right now. We aren't gonna add any hops this time, but I am gonna add uh, some firm cap S. So if you haven't seen that, this prevents boil overs. So I am still gonna add that even during my sour process. All right, we're just getting up to the boil now. So you can see it's starting to do a rapid boil. We're gonna keep an eye on this thing. We do need to probably turn it down a little bit, make sure that it's not gonna boil over. And then um, we're gonna boil this for 15 minutes to help reduce some of the volume and to kill off any of that bacteria. And then uh, once this thing boils for 15 minutes, we're gonna cool down like normal. In our wort chiller, we're gonna cool it down to about 110 or so. Once that happens, um, and we get it down to about 110, we'll go through the whole souring process. All right, we are done with the boil, done with the cooling off. It is sitting at about, I'd say about 108 degrees or so right now, and that's okay, because we're gonna be doing some things and it'll cool down to about 100, but that's about where you want it. So, because um, that's okay, and it'll help the uh, um, bacteria in the Good Belly probiotic uh, take hold and start souring even at that uh, higher temperature. They, some kettle sours require you to stay at 100 degrees. You do not need to do that for this recipe. So with the Good Belly, it doesn't matter if it cools down under 100, but it will stay a little bit warmer as it does its thing. So first things first, we are going to be doing some lactic acid, but you're gonna to wanna to see where your pH is first. So I have a calibrated pH meter. I'm gonna go ahead and see where we are with our pH after that little boil. So I'm gonna put that in here. So we should be trying to go from about mid fives, five point something to about four and a half is what we're gonna try and shoot for. Now we're at like five, six, five, seven. After it starts calming down a little bit here. So we are going to rinse this in some uh, distilled water in between each one of these things so you don't have to keep going back and forth. So I just keep a little cup of distilled water. Then I'm gonna take a syringe like this one. It's a medicine syringe you can get from uh, any pharmacy. And I'm gonna put about seven milliliters or so. I think we need to get to 10, maybe a little more, but I'm gonna put seven and see where we're at. So I'm gonna 
suck up about seven milliliters of lactic acid and just we're gonna dribble that guy in there. Then we're gonna go ahead and stir that around a little bit. Just to get the lactic acid in there. This is gonna help drop that pH to an uh, to a, uh, a lower level it will help prevent any bad bacteria from really starting other than the good belly. So that's dropped it. Should be under five or so. Shouldn't need to shake this that much, but it does take a second to kind of stable out. It's actually about 5.1. Right now we need to get to about four and a half. Yeah, 5.07 or so it's sitting right now. So we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit more. Again, you can always add more. You can, it's harder to take it out. So go ahead, I'm gonna add this time. Let's put uh, about three milliliters in it. there and give it a quick stir see where we're at should be again should, we're shooting for about four and a half it doesn't have to be exact and the good belly probiotic will continue to to drop uh, in volume or uh, excuse me it'll continue to drop the pH as it sours so the longer it sits the more it will sour 4.8 too much more so about 4.8 so we need to if that dropped at about 0.3 we need probably another three milliliters or so I would say so this one's a little bit more than normal and it'll depend on each batch but it's around 10 to 15 milliliters give that again stir again so so far we've put in 13 milliliters seven three and three now all right it's about 4.65 i'm going to put one more milliliter in and then whatever it is we're going to leave it at that one more milliliter and then we will start our transfer into our sanitized um i have a sanitized fermenter a glass fermenter and we're going to put this good belly probiotic drink in there and that's about where it's going to stay so it's at See if you guys can see that here. It's about 4.5856. And the temperature it says is 103.2. So again, as we've been stirring it, it's been dropping a little bit, that's fine. So 4.5, that's about right where we wanna be. Again, rinse this in some distilled water, get all that off there before you store it. All right, we have our sanitized carboy. I have my Good Belly probiotic drink. I have to take the seal off here after I sanitize the lid and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and dump this right in. The flavor does not matter. So you'll see that I'm using like a strawberry banana flavor. That doesn't matter. The flavoring of this will actually drop out in the first fermentation period. And uh, and it really isn't gonna affect the flavoring all that much. There is uh, a lighter mango flavor. So something like peaches, I would probably try and do that. That's what, that wasn't available at the store that I had. So in a pinch, you can use whichever one. I do try to match the flavors a little bit if I can, but. Um, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. So go ahead and dump that in first because you want to make sure that that gets in there before all of the beer. So if you do have extra volume, you will leave out beer, not the good belly. So go ahead and, or wort anyway, go ahead and transfer this guy in. And then what I'm going to do uh, is grab a sanitized piece of saran wrap and the lid. And that is what is going to go over the top, pressing just against the thing. This should fill up almost all the way to the rim of this when it's all the way done filling up and then uh, we will let this sit overnight after about 18 hours or so I'm going to start testing the pH and we want it to get to about three and a half sometimes a little bit lower if I'm using a sweet fruit so in this case uh, peaches you could actually get it down to 3.4 possibly 3.3 because there is sugars in there um, and that's okay uh, but that is up to you and how much sour you want that beer to actually be so that's really a preference thing at the end of the day all right, so we got our lid. Again, you don't need an airlock. It's not going to ferment. It's literally just gonna sour. So this will just prevent any sloshing or spilling over the side for that. And then the sanitizer will prevent any oxygen and other things from getting in there. I only put the saran wrap on there. Um, so it doesn't come out this hole and you don't need an airlock, but you could just put the cap on and then 
you know, a bung or something like that, and then an airlock just to prevent that from any air from getting in there. But in this case, that's why I use the saran wrap, just because it's in a pinch, it's a lot easier. So we're gonna go ahead and let this sit. I'm gonna put it in a, actually just in a spare bedroom and I wrap a towel around it, just so it doesn't get light penetration. And again, we'll start checking in in about 18 hours. All right, guys, we are back. The very next day, I have my fermenter in here. It's been under this uh, towel. It's been a little over 20 hours, so I normally start checking this about 18 hours, but it's been a little over 20, maybe actually closer to 21 hours. We're gonna go ahead and check this, see what the pH is. We're looking for it to have dropped from four and a half to three and a half. So we have our pH meter here. I'm gonna turn that on. You can already smell that it's sour, so I can tell you it's done just from the many times I've done this before. And you're seeing it just drop into 3.57. Yeah, it looks like 3.53, so right where we need to be. We drop from four and a half to three and a half. I'm gonna go ahead again, rinse this off with distilled water, make sure that that's not, um, that's not, that doesn't be kept on there with any sticky stuff. Um, make sure you clean that properly and then put this away. We won't need the pH meter any longer. We're going to go ahead and take this out. We're going to get this back into our kettle and boiling it. That will uh, actually stop the souring process and uh, we'll bring, bring it back up to a boil uh, and finish our 45 minute boil. Since we did 15 minutes yesterday, today we only need to do 45 minutes. All right, now we got that thing heating up. Once it gets over at about 150, 170 degrees, that souring process stops and it's gonna start to boil. And this is if you're gonna add any hops in your recipe at all, this is when you would add those hops. So it would be on day two, you don't wanna add those on day one. That would affect souring process. Any hop additions at all will be at this boil, not the first one. And so we're gonna let this get up to a boil. I'm, for this recipe, not adding any hops. Normally for my sours, I don't add any hops at all. Um, the ones I've done, they really don't come through very much, especially if you add fruit flavors because those generally kind of take over the show anyway. So we're gonna let this boil for 45 minutes. Then afterwards, we're gonna cool down like normally. We're gonna put it in a fermenter, fermenter like normal, and we're gonna pitch our yeast. Today, we're using two packets of US05. Um, this USO5, you probably could get away with just doing one. I like to, because of the lower pH of the beer, um, have a little bit more um, yeast cells uh, in case some of them are affected by the lower pH. I like to just pitch two. Uh, but in this case, um, I've done it with one packet before. I just so happen to have two of them on hand, so I'm just going to pitch two of them today. We don't add any peaches until we get to the secondary. So we're going to wait till primary fermentation finishes up, and then we're going to add our peaches after that. All right, we have our beer all the way chilled to about, uh, about 78, 79 degrees. Um, the rest of the time it's gonna cool down as we're transferring it. I don't mind, especially with USO5 for it being uh, in the um, mid 70s while I pitch my yeast. So by the time I get this transferred and put it into um, the fermentation chamber, it should be about there and we'll go ahead and pitch our yeast. But we're gonna get this transferred in. All right, guys, so we are back. It has been about a week or so and we're ready to start prepping our fruit for secondary. So we're gonna pull that uh, out of the fermentation chamber shortly. We're gonna transfer that into a different uh, carboy on top of six pounds of peaches. And so here I have grabbed frozen peaches. You can use fresh fruits if you are using a different type of fruit or even peaches. If you're using fresh, I would suggest prepping them first and then freezing them. The freezing process, if you don't buy them already frozen, will help kill any bacteria and things that are on them, and they will prevent it from introducing something, something wild and nasty into your beer. So you want to be able to kill that off in one of two ways. You can 
prep them, mash them up like we're gonna do today and freeze them. Uh, or you can uh, pasteurize them, which also means you can raise that temperature up to about 150, 160 degrees or so. That should kill off any of the wild bacteria and stuff that are on there. Uh, it will also give it kind of a, a wine flavor-ish if you pasteurize. So that, that uh, is something to think about depending on what flavors you want to go in your final beer. But what we usually do here is actually just uh, freeze the fruit if we haven't bought it already frozen, which is what we're using today. If you do buy it frozen, you're ahead of the game. That's why a lot of times that's easier, especially if you don't care where the produce comes from. In this case, it's out of season right now to have peaches, uh, but I do use a lot of local uh, blackberries and other things uh, in the summertime when they're readily available. So I'll let me show you a little, a couple things that you need um, to get started. First, you need a beer because we are brewing. You also need your fruits, obviously, a potato masher or something else to mash some things up, and then a sanitized bowl, and I use a large paint strainer bag. This one's a five gallon bag, and I'll have links to this in the video description of where you can get those things if you don't know where to, to buy those. Um, and so you start by just taking your paint strainer bag and slipping it over the top of this bowl. So you wanna get a fairly large one, just because, a fairly large bowl, because the, uh, there's a lot of fruit going in here. And I also let this fruit sit out on my counter for a little while. So it's a little uh, it's a little soft in here and that's makes it, it's gonna make it easier to mash up, right? So you don't really want it to be very, very hard. It's gonna make it difficult to uh, mash up. And so I've let this sit out for a few hours. They're starting to get where I can pinch the peaches uh, and break them up with my fingers through the bag. So that's about the right way you wanna do it. So without further ado, we're gonna get started by just dumping these things right into our paint strainer bag. And before I put all of them in there, I do like to get a few of them and then start mashing them uh, so you can get the ones at the bottom pretty good and then add some more on the top, mash those. So I'll just go ahead and start mashing these up. Again, we're not looking to break them all up into small pieces. Um, you know, we're just trying to really mash them up, break them in uh, to tinier than the slices that they are, but not really trying to get to a puree. Now you can puree them if you want to, so really we're just trying to get them uh, to really break up a little bit um, and open up that surface area to the beer, right? So it doesn't have to be pureed. You can do that if you want to, uh, but it's really not that necessary to um, have them broken into tiny, tiny pieces. You can tell some of these are pretty frozen compared to others that were on, probably on the outside of the package, but that's all right. It's not gonna hurt the beer to go in cold. All right, then once you got them kind of like this, where they're just kind of broken up, they don't, again, they don't have to be real mashed. There's some whole pieces in there still, but I've just really kind of uh, hit a bunch of them. Some of them got cut in half. We're just uh, exposing as much surface area as we can uh, to the beer. So after we get done with that, we're just gonna take our paint strainer bag, pull it up back over the lid of this bowl, and then we're gonna tie it closed. This works if you're using a fermenter like mine that has a big mouth bubbler. You can use a bucket, that's totally fine. Um, I would suggest if you're using for sours, just kind of use the same bucket for sours. One question I get asked a lot is, can you use um, the same equipment for sours? And that's uh, generally yes, if you're doing kettle sours like this process. If you're using a different process, we're using wild yeast, wild bacterias, that will uh, uh, create, you know, um, over time, just letting it sit in the closet and it'll kind of catch wild bacteria, then no. Then you wanna use different lines, different transferring equipment, that kind of thing. Kettle sours, totally fine to use the same stuff, but I would recommend, again, just make sure you're washing your stuff immediately after using it. Um, I use the same lines. I do usually do have a dedicated sour tap, but that's not necessary. You can change it out even in your beer fridge. So not a big deal at all when you're using kettle sours. All right, so I have my clean and sanitized glass carboy. I'm gonna go ahead and put this fruit in there. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of shimmying and making it a little thinner to get it in there, uh, but you can get it right past the sides. by just kind of playing around like this. And it'll slide right in there. I usually take like, a napkin or something, wipe off the outside, but it's in there. Now we just have to go ahead and rack this beer right on the top of it. I do get asked sometimes, well, what if I use the smaller necked fermenters or 
something else, that's totally fine. You can do that. A couple different uh, options you have. So if you have a small neck fermenter, you can um, just put the fruit right inside of this vessel and then use your racking cane. You would take a smaller, like maybe one of the one gallon paint strainer bags and you could uh, rubber band or even zip tie on a smaller one. That will help prevent sucking up any of the particles from your fruit or seeds or whatever, if you're using raspberries or blackberries or whatever, and, uh, and put that in there when you're transferring to a, to a keg. And so, uh, or to a bottling bucket if you're bottling. And so that will help prevent uh, any uh, of those particles from getting in there. We're gonna let the beer pull out all those uh, nice peach flavors. Um, it's gonna need a full week to do that. You're probably gonna see a little bit of fermentation activity. That's totally fine because it is sugar that we have in the uh, peaches, but it's not gonna be like a full on fermentation like you had uh, during primary fermentation. So a little bit of activity is totally fine and, and totally normal. Um, so go ahead and let that sit for a week. Again, probably at room temperature, uh, the temperature control is a little less important. So if you had to, you could put this in a spare bedroom and keep your fermentation chamber for a different beer if you want to. Uh, but I just take it right back in the fermentation chamber, still at about 67 to 70 degrees, somewhere between there, uh, and then let it do its job for, for a week. And that's all there is to it. So sours, although they're a couple of day process, there's not much to them. They're very similar to doing any other type of brew day, other than a little bit of the uh, dropping of that pH from day one to day two using that Good Belly probiotic or some other way of souring your beer. Uh, other than that, I suggest you try it if you haven't done that. I've got a more in-depth on how to do a kettle sour and how to do a full brew day videos. I'll have those again down in the video description if you wanna check those out. With that, hit that like and subscribe button. Helps the channel out a lot. Happy brewing and cheers. Thanks for watching my video. I really do appreciate it. Another couple ways that you can help support the channel is by hitting that like and subscribe button. You can also check out the merchandise in our store. I have other shirts. We got glassware, we got stickers, hats, sweatshirts, etc. Go check it out. Also, hit that video here. You know you want to.